All right. So, did anyone solve this problem for a uh, free homework problem? Remember, you were supposed to prove to me that. Uh, no? Yeah, how about the next week? Next week is the deadline. So, you have next week to solve this problem. All right? For a free homework problem. You can prove that this is equal to this. Yeah, this is the notes. This is our lecture notes. Yeah. All right. So we finished last time by basically saying figure D1 will help us to, if we know the deflection angle, this should read delta. In our book, this is delta and this is the shock wave, theta. We said if you know delta, you will come up here and you know your Mach number, <coughs> right? And you will basically be able to read theta. And we said that for each Mach number, you will end up hitting the curve. So all those guys are different Mach number, okay? Different Mach number one. So Mach number one increase in that direction. He reached infinity over here, okay? So this last one is Mach one equal infinity, or like really, really large, basically. Okay, so once, even if you know the Mach number and say, let's say it's 2.5, for the same delta, you can hit this 2.5 you can hit it here, or you can hit it here. And that will result in two different theta, 50 or say uh, 70, 76. Well, one of them is called the weak solution, one of them is the strong solution. The, see this line, this blue line? That basically say anything here will result in M2 or actually better make it in blue. For this range, M2, that's after the shock. M2 is supersonic. So the flow goes through the oblique shock and still come out supersonic. Well, what about the other side? Well, the other side, of course, would be subsonic. Subsonic M2. So above that line, you leave a subsonic the end of the supersonic flow. It's a very strong shock. That's why they call it strong shock. It killed the supersonic flow, you are subsonic. So what this means is that if you have the strong solution, you will always end up with subsonic M2. If you have the weak solution, you will have supersonic or slightly subsonic. Okay? So when you see in a problem that the flow after the shock, after the brick shock is supersonic, then was that a strong solution or weak solution? If the flow after the shock is supersonic, well, it will have to be a weak solution. If the flow after the shock is still supersonic, he survived, yeah. that means the shock was really weak. He managed to go through it and come out supersonic. So well, how can I tell the flow is supersonic? So what's the blue line? You said the red line was the the, let's, let, I'll go back again to it again. But now let's see. What do you think the flow after the first shock? Is it supersonic or subsonic? How could you tell that the flow after the sho first shock is supersonic? Because it runs into another oblique shock wave. Has it been subsonic? There would be no other oblique shock after that. He will just you know, manage his way through the engine without any shock waves. How about after the second oblique shock? Is he subsonic in two or, subs or supersonic? Because he goes through this one. By the way, see this black line here? That's just the inlet. Huh? That's the inlet of the engine under the, after the, the nose, right? And he keeps supersonic, and he keeps supersonic, and he keeps supersonic. Okay, the last one, how could you tell he's still supersonic? Well, because that's a scram engine, and I told you it's supersonic in the engine, so, so you can tell. But, I mean, if we just look here, we cannot really tell, right? Maybe he's actually subsonic after the last one, <coughs> right? Okay, so back to, the, to that chart. So this, the line that goes through the max, Huh? The line that goes through the max, forget about the color, because different book will have different color. Our book, we don't have any colors. So don't look at the color. It's 
the one goes through the nose of each curve the one that goes through the nose huh that's the one basically saying strong or weak right let's go this way or go that way all right and and the one that's under it and you will see it they will tell you that's the m equal m2 equal one so just sonic so above it you are subsonic exit below it you are supersonic exit and he will always be lower than the the division because again strong solution is really strong there is no supersonic exit after it okay so what is the and the same thing actually in d4 and d5 so d4 and d5 those are very useful graph to solve problem but they are very hard to read so you probably will depend on a on a, on a solver compressible flow solver to solve those problem but in the quiz next week and the exam you probably will have to use this guy so what does d4 do well what did d1 do for us d1 you put the delta and m1 you can get the seat okay in d4 you put the delta and m1 and you can get m2 and that's a big deal because remember last time we went through a lot of trouble to get m2 we said we can get m2 normal from the chart from c easily but then m2 normal is m2 sine sine what you remember theta minus delta so you will have to work again what is delta so that you can get uh, m2 out of it but this this chart make it easy just knowing delta and m1 you can easily read m2 now the weak and the strong are flipped so be careful so the weak is on top and the strong is actually at the bottom you will see it in the chart it will tell you where is the weak and where is the strong and you will see the value too what's also annoying is that the x the y axis is not reading m2 what does it read can anyone open d4 for me and tell me what does the y axis read one minus one over m2 so you are reading one minus one over m2 so after you do that you put it on the calculator and you get m2 out of it right so you think they could have labeled it m2 you know what is the big deal let's just have one. anyway so what here is the difference between strong and weak so strong m2 is subsonic end of the story no more supersonic flow for us no soap for you okay <laughs> so that's the the shock nazi basically no more shocks after that weak solution m2 is supersonic or slightly subsonic this will result in small b2 over b1 this will result in very large pressure it's it's as if it's a normal shock so very large b2 over b1 and actually that's the reason that this guy will be triggered or this guy will be triggered it's this fact that this guy will generate very large p2 over p1 so we will not be able to support this very large p2 over p1 in things flying in open air you need to have confinement you need to have wall to be able to keep that very high pressure behind it to sustain this strong shock okay so if you have any problem in the exam or the quiz that basic things are flying without seeing the walls you know it's weak solution also if you see the shock is is basically a super sun flow is surviving behind the shock you know it's a weak solution all right if the say i'm telling you and uh you know a supersonic vehicle is flying uh supersonically and there are sh or shocks or peak shock waves triggered at the nose find for me the the pressure after the shock you know it's flying in air you know it will be a weak solution because there is nothing to keep very high pressure behind the shock right and so the fact that the oblique shock you know can really have very small uh drop in p note that's basically the reason why they have the those inlet huh so this is the 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 black bird it's flying at max 3 okay and so because it's flying on max 3 well you can really generate very high pressure this thing was designed before computer was built okay those people designed this thing with basically was a, a pencil and a piece of paper 
right? So you're using an Excel file, you know, and, and solving today homework would be like, wow, this is, okay? So this is amazing, considering, so what, what they are doing over here? So because they have so much kinetic energy, their nose can trigger oblique shock waves, okay? Those oblique shock waves will raise the pressure, and because they are flying at very high velocity, that would be enough to look at this. It will basically, you don't need a compressor. Again, this is called not a scram engine. This is ramjet engine rather than scramjet engine. It's ramjet engine. The, the, en the combustion is happening at subsonic velocity. All right? So with the oblique shock, we kind of raise the pressure and then Basically, you, you even try to slow the flow even more, right? And once you have enough pressure over here, all you need is the combustion first and then the nozzle, right? The combustion and then the nozzle. And then the flow leaves supersonically, and as you can see, the, the trail of diamond shape, and we will talk about this in after two <laughs> lectures, how basic, how many of those, and how do they look like, and right? <coughs> So this actually can be controlled. They, they pull this back up and down or basically back and forth until you get exactly the right area star. You get the right basically slowing down of the flow so that you can get as high pressure as possible. Of course, when you are at starting at the ground, you know, starting to take off, there's no max 3. There's no oblique shock wave. There are no compression done by this guy. And therefore, let's shut down. Let's shut down what? The ramjet engine and let's run the turbojet, right, with a compressor and turbine and everything. And this just will be kind of a uh, argumenter. Like after you finish the combustion, you even you need more thrust by dumping even more fuel. And after burner basically. Alright? You can just see it landing. It's actually very good music too. See, again, those cones are designed so that you would basically slow down the air with an oblique shock. If they didn't have this cone, just the inlet, you will have normal a normal shock standing in front. And that's huge loss of P note. Okay? And you guys know that this thing flies so high that they actually, they wear the same suits that they had it in the... Right. Is that only for surveillance? And actually, th it was very successful to the extent that after the retirement, when the U.S. went for, look at this first. Look at the diamond chain. That wasn't a good job, huh? Th that even after the retirement of this fleet, they brought it back for the Gulf War because it's better than uh, spy satellites. Because spy satellites have a period, you know where they are, right? And you can hide your stuff, you know, every they have a cycle, so you know that he's coming after six hours, you hide the stuff, bring the stuff. But with this, you never know when it's coming. So they brought it back out of retirement just for the for the Gulf War, second Gulf War. All right. So now the, the the other question that I would like you to be aware of is that, so those things are actually cones, right? And our homework, we are designing wedges, 2D, always 2D. So will the flow over a 2D be different from the flow over a cone? Yes. Yes, the answer is why. It is different. The equation that we have right now doesn't solve the flow over a cone. Say that again. So it's it's actually it's 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 very that's the that's the, the the right or correct to the right answer. It's really the fact that the two D is kind of a really strong obstruction to the flow. It's the fl supersonic flow can never find its way around it. It's like he will always be obstructed by that two D, 
And so the flow over a wedge will always look like this. But look, the flow over a cone, what will happen? It, there is basically more space. As this circle get bigger and bigger, there's actually more space for the flow. So the flow here is kind of, he's always forced away from the wall in that same direction. But over here, once he goes through the first part, then he can relax inside the, right? So there are table to actually, you would think well, that's horrible because now every one of those guys will have different Mach number, different pressure. That's kind of true, but all we really care about is the pressure on the, the surface. So you only care about this guy to get that drag and uh, you just need the pressure on the wall. So you, you don't really need that much the other guys. Yes, Yang. So do you want the shock waves to like roll off the surface or do you want it to like not touch the surface at all? So it really depends on what, what you're going to do. So if we are trying to, if this was an inlet for an engine, huh? I actually would like to get the, the shock to, s to finish here so that nothing skip out. I don't want any other flow. I want to scoop as much as I can, right? If this was uh, for something that's going through the entry, I don't want it even to come close to my surface. I want the shock to be basically, this is my surface. I want the shock to stay away from me. And we'll see how we can do this. We want to send it away from us. But we'll see in a second how far we can, how, or how can we send it away from us. So here is an example. So delta is 9, M1, P1, and T1 are given, required M2, P2, and T2. Unlike the problem that we solved last week where we actually had the theta, and once the, you have the theta, the problem is over. Why? Because you get M1 normal, M1 sine theta, go to a normal shock table, get everything you want. So that's the easy problem. The harder problem, or a little bit harder, is that if you have delta and M1, you don't have theta. And he's asking for B2 and T2 and M2, what do you do? Anyone? I don't know theta. And it's not M2, it's M1 normal, by the way. M1 normal is M1 sine theta. So to do this, so that I can take it to appendix C and get my B2 over P1 and T2 over T1 and B over, I need theta. Can anyone <coughs> give me theta? D1, right? So that graph, that's our friend to solve those kind of problems, basically. If you know delta and you know M1 and you know is it weak shock or strong shock, you can get your theta. So it's D1 that will solve those problems. Again, knowing M1 and delta, you should get theta out of it. All right? And so not only you will get theta and then go to uh, to normal shock table. I'm not going to tell you how to solve a normal shock anymore. You know how to do that. Not only you can get theta from D1, you can also get what from D4. Right. From D4, if you know delta and you have those other graphs, you will go here. See how I'm getting the weak shock from the top now? I can get M2. So knowing M1 and delta, I can get my M2. All right? If you don't like that graph, you can always do, who got the free homework <laughs> last week for solving that? You can, you can get M2 normal. Right? And then say M2 normal is M2 sine theta minus delta. Right? It's not a big <coughs> deal. M2 normal is, uh, so M2 normal will come from appendix C. And that's M2 sine theta minus delta. You have delta and you have theta, you can solve for M2. So you have the equation, you have the graph. A long way, a long method is, well, M2 is basically related to T2 and T02. So you can solve for T2 and you have T02 from T1 and M1. You can solve M2 this way. Right? I think probably this is the easiest. Right? Because the graph is really hard to read. This is much easier and short. And uh, going to solve T2 and solving M2, that sounds really long. Like you are solving two problems. 
So that's what he's saying. We need m1 normal, so for, therefore we need theta, and we'll get theta from d1, and we can get m2 from d4. Right? Another problem. I will let you actually solve this. Well, actually, no, let me solve it. So <laughs> he said supersonic wind tunnel, right? And they put a wedge in the in the flow. They put a wedge inside this thing, and they think that they think that they can actually measure the flow. What is the Mach number just by measuring the angle? So I mean, if they look at the shock using some kind of shadow graphy technique, measuring technique, and by that remind me, there is an excellent expert in shadow graphy and visualization in supersonic flow and in flow in general from Penn State tomorrow, tomorrow at I'm, I'm going to Stillwater tomorrow in the morning so I'll be back hopefully uh, before 3 o'clock or at 3.15 3.30 for my office hour I have my office hour here at 3 to 5 on Tuesdays so I'm going to go there to meet him to, to attend his seminar and then have lunch and meet, sit with him a little bit and so I'll, I'll try to be back here by 3.50 you call me before you come to my office call my cell phone to make sure that I already arrived right and if you have free time tomorrow I would strongly recommend that you would go to see his work all right so anyway so they think well if they take a picture they and measure the angle they can tell what's the Mach number just by measuring theta right so he's saying well how long will that if the total angle is 45 what is the Mach number that will be able to measure with such a device so turn out that if the angle is 45, there's a certain range of Mach number that will generate the shock waves. There's a cut off. Other Mach number will not generate the shock waves. How come? Let's look at the chart. So if we are saying that the Mach is, sorry, the delta is, uh, and the delta is half the wedge angle, okay? So if the total, if the included angle of the wedge is 45, that make our delta, how much? Say the total included angle of the wedge is 45. Obviously that is the whole thing is 45. So what is our delta? 22, 22 right? So if 22 is basically this guy, 22.5, what that mean? It means that anything less than this Mac number, the one that touched 22, what will happen then? What about this Mac number? If I have delta 22.5 and I have this Mac number, I don't hit the curve. I mean, anything above this Mac number, including Mac 1, you know, uh, 3 and infinity, they all intersect with delta. There is a solution. There is weak shock and strong shock. But things on this side, like this guy, for example, no shock, so what? Still supersonic flow, still seeing uh, something. He will generate a shock, but it's not oblique shock. It would be <coughs> a normal shock. So I would like you to think, basically, imagine yourself in a supersonic flow. It's hard, but imagine. Huh? And you see the switch in front of you. And if you are really strong, you had very strong breakfast, you have a lot of energy, you will be able to basically Go all the way, even huh? Even to the nose and make this thing. The stronger you are, the more you'll be able to enclose the shock on the on the wedge. And the weaker you are, the more the shock will you'll be basically will see it from far away. It will overcome you. And the shock will end up being basically something like this. And even if you are weaker, huh, than this M1, you may be even not able to come that close. You will have to basically transition subsonic even from farther away right so the stronger you are the smaller the theta and you can see it here look at this so this m1 compared to that m1 the stronger the m1 the smaller the theta it's kind of the shock is closing on the wedge so the gap between the shock wave and the wedge gets smaller and smaller he kind of like squeeze everything in between because he got just really too strong to see. So All right? No, if you are imagining that he will basically stop on the no, it will never be basically completely covering the wedge because the flow still need to escape. 
right? So it will never be exactly on the on the wedge. But look, look at this last d max. So all the graph, including infinity, basically finish here. So this last d max, which is like 40 something, 45 for our year, gamma 1.4, that means that any wedge bigger than this 45 will never be able to support an oblique shock in it. No matter what is the Mach number, even if it's 25, when say the re-entry of the space, the space vehicle and he's coming at very high Mach number, if this cone or this entrance is basically having an angle, I'm trying to make a, a really big angle. If this angle is like really super big, there will always be just a normal shock outside and will never come as a oblique shock on the nose. All right? So you see how they basically make the inlet kind of like really <coughs> flat so that they will make the shock further away from them. Okay? So, so how he can find the range again for this last problem? Where for that delta, you can read the M1, right? And so this would be the minimum. You need to be higher than 1.97 to be able to support an oblique shock in that wedge that we are solving. Question about this? Right, very good, excellent, excellent. So that's why supersonic, not just airplane, supersonic compressor plates. Well, the flow could be supersonic inside your compressor, air compressor. Huh? Those are not the reciprocating compressor, I'm talking about the, basically the open type. So the plates will have to have sharp inlet so that you will generate oblique shock, not normal shock. Normal shock that's loss of, of isentropic pressure, of P naught, total pressure. So you wanna make it basically such that you will end up with an oblique shock, all right? Those guys, if you see the plates of the turbine or the compressor is like this, that means they are subsonic. They are running subsonic, not supersonic. Okay. So here is a problem on the on the inlet. He's basically saying this is the Mach number. This is exactly like your homework. So he's saying here is the Mach number. Here is the pressure. Here is the temperature. Infinity B infinity and M infinity. Those are the pressure before the shock. Okay. And you would like the pressure inside. So how do you do it? Well, you solve first the oblique shock and then you solve the normal shock. It's still supersonic. So that supersonic flow will have to go through a normal shock to go inside the engine. <coughs> All right? All right, I'll let you look at the solution at home. But the point when you solve this, you'll find out that the pressure dropped so much. He dropped 0 0.6 times 0 0.9. He dropped in the normal shock 0.63%. Or basically, no, the other, the, the 35. Okay? He dropped 65% of his original value. And on the oblique shock, he dropped nothing. 0 0.99994. That was one oblique shock, one normal shock. So how, how do you improve that inlet? If you basically you are the design engineer and telling you that sucks, we don't really want to have such a really low pressure. We are hoping to get high, higher pressure than this. You would look and say, well, that's my weakest link. How can I weaken that normal shock a little bit? It's so strong because the inlet Mach number to it is 2.18. If only my inlet Mach number to the normal shock is smaller. It wouldn't bend so strong, it wouldn't have that high pressure. So, you would say <coughs> two oblique shocks. If I have two oblique shocks, huh? by the time, you would say, but that's extra losses. Yeah, but look at the 0 0.83, 0 0.9, but look at the saving in the normal shock. The, the saving eventually will pay off. <coughs> Right, so if you are even trying to improve on this, what would you say? Now let's create Windows 10 of those engines. What is the uh, even improvement, more improvement than this? We went through phase one, that was one oblique shock, phase two, two oblique shock, and now you want to dominate the market, so what do you do? 
that's that's like Windows Vista, right? But you wanna completely something new. We're gonna do something completely new. No, let's not go through your peak shock. Let's go. We already went been through two, right? No, it doesn't work. We wanna make improvement. Huh? No, guys, be creative. Infinite number of bleak shock waves, right? Let's do it like this. So if you have a really kind of smooth inlet, huh? Which those will not be oblique shock wave. Those would be. Those are not oblique shock wave. Those are for a free homework problem, huh? No. For a free homework problem, those are. Those are not oblique shock wave. Those are. Mac waves, because the delta is so small. It's not like we are hitting it with one degree. We are hitting it with like really tiny, tiny change. So that's the closest you get to kind of isentropic compression. Yeah. Actually, someone had a free homework problem on exactly the same name before. Remember on when we were talking about D1 last week, and I said. What are the angles those guys are going to? And someone got, probably I don't forgot who, Tim. Tim got a free quiz for saying those are the Mac waves. Should have remembered from last week. All right. So now, now what happened at the shock reflection? Because you need this for the homework. So again, those reflection, huh? are very useful for those kind of scramjet engine, right? Without them, we will not be able to solve this part. So the first two shock waves, and by the way, they don't have necessary to go through the inlet. I mean, they could be something like this. But again, to scoop all the flow, you want them to basically be lab on, huh? Lab on the, so that you can get basically all the flow. So what happened when the flow reflects? Why does it trigger another oblique shock wave when it hit the flow? So we understand why the first oblique shock wave is triggered, right? <coughs> why? Why was this guy triggered? Mac 1 was coming here, equal 5, 4, 3, whatever. Why did this shock trigger it? No, because the delta. That was the only reason why we had an oblique shock wave. Because we changed the flow direction. The moment we said to the supersonic flow, let's go down by 10 degrees, he cannot do it slowly, gradually. He has to do it through a discontinuity, all right? So now what, what's going on after that wedge, after this first shock? Everything is moving with delta. It's the deflection angle. That's a very, for the first time, they call things really right. It's really the deflection of the flow. Everything is deflected with that delta, be it 4 degree, like our homework, it's 4.6 in our, or 4 point something in our homework. But everything is moving at that line. Do you expect a problem? Yeah, I expect a problem. There's a wall. This, they cannot keep going at 4 degree downward. Because once they hit that wall, once that shock come here, bad news guys, <coughs> there is a floor. Everything <coughs> now need to go Horizontal. So how they could switch between going down at four degree and start moving horizontally again? They have to have another oblique shock wave. And here's what's hard for the students. This probably will be in your second midterm. Okay, the second midterm will probably have an oblique shock wave. What's hard in something like this is to spot the second delta. Students make a mistake. Because that's all you need to solve the problem, right? If you know the Mach number here and the delta that is going through, it will be as if you're solving the same problem again. So what is the delta here? Or let me rephrase the question. How much did I deflect the flow in the second part to trigger that shock, the second shock? What was the deflection angle that caused the second shock? Excellent. And this answer is really hard for some students to see that the, the second flow was also deflected the same delta, the, so, the same four degree. Huh? It's easy, but still it's really hard to see. 
because the first one was sending them down four degree and the second one need to straighten them up and break them straight again so it's the same delta and by the way see this is that how delta is measured from right what am I plotting that's kind of the original the direction before the shock that's where everyone was planning to go so delta is not measured from the floor delta is measured from the previous the before direction to the wall huh that's this and also that's where look at this that's where the seat is measured also it's kind of this is now my new wedge there is a wedge like this imaginary wedge that's sitting there under the floor okay so back to our homework so he gave you delta one four point something and he's asking about delta two look at where is delta two this is delta two Wh where is where are they measuring it from measuring it from the before direction now after the shock everyone is moving with this wall right <coughs> you see that wall the original wall everything was planning to move like this but you hit it with this new wedge that's the delta 2 so he's asking about that delta that will trigger that theta so what so that the Mach number here m5 is 3.13 how they are related why would that delta affect that Mach number because what is now notes that after the shock the first shock before the shock, he was moving horizontal. After the first shock, he's moving with, he's moving downward with delta one. delta one. And after the second shock, he's moving downward with, no, delta one plus delta two, right? Right, after the second shock, he's moving with delta one plus delta two. He's moving with the upper wall, that's what he's doing. And the upper wall of the engine, is delta 1 plus delta 2 and then after the third shock which is triggered from the floor the third shock which is trig triggered from the floor for a free homework problem he's moving with which direction no no I'm asking I'm asking after the third shock which is triggered from the floor what is the angle that he's moving with? Same as the Excellent. He had free hole problem. And the floor is horizontal. Yeah, zero right. So he basically... No, no. You don't have a free hole problem yet. <laughs> I, wait, wait, guys. Wait, he's about to get... <laughs> he's moving horizontally, correct? <laughs> right? But I'm asking about what is the deflection angle? What is the deflection angle? No. No. The deflection angle that triggered the third shock is? <coughs> it's delta 1 plus delta 2. <laughs> Did anyone say delta 1 plus delta 2? I think so. Who said delta 1 plus delta 2? You did? Okay, you get it. You get the free homework. Well, Sean doesn't get it. So, <laughs> sorry, you get another one. So my point is, wh why the third deflection angle is delta one plus delta two? Because before the third shock, he was moving downward with delta one plus delta two. And right, what what Sean said is that after the third shock, he's moving with the floor. The floor is horizontal again. So he was moving downward. Now he's moving horizontal. So. He is, so we know, it came in horizontal, and then right, and then next so the force. Question. Look at that. The force, the force shock wave is triggered by now the deflection from the upper wall, forcing the flow to move again with the upper wall, which is the deflection angle now in the force one is delta one plus delta two, and the fifth one triggered by reflection from the floor, which is horizontal, and so the deflection angle is delta one plus delta two. End of the story. So he was going through delta one, then delta two, then delta one plus delta two, delta one plus delta two, delta one plus delta two. So then 
the value for delta 2 that you are trying to figure out will affect not only the second shock but the other three shocks so it's a trial and error problem you will have to adjust delta 2 so that you get that end result at the end so if you do this over excel it will save you a lot of time rather than basically do it on paper over and over and over so good luck thank you, thank you.